<laughs> if you are watching on YouTube, <laughs> good morning as well. We're trying to get um, back together in the recordings. Also, if you are um, tech savvy and you'd like to be a part of recording the sermons, uh, please let me know because I don't feel like, or Josh just went like this, or helping with the desk, please let us know. Okay, so we are looking at um, Ephesians at the moment, which is really exciting. I really love Ephesians. There it is. If you have a look in my Bible at Ephesians, you'll see that it's like it's like the most highlighted and you know, the page is going to be funny after you read it lots of times. I really do like Ephesians. Um, and so when thinking about what we share about for this year, Ephesians came up. Um, I think it might have actually been Lynn who gave the idea when I said I want to preach through some of the books in the Bible, and we did uh, Mark earlier in the year. But I was like, let's preach through Ephesians, because there's so much in Ephesians about our identity. And something that I think is really important for us as believers is to understand our identity in Christ. So we're going to continue on with Ephesians this morning, but why don't we just pray first? Oh, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here this morning. And Lord, as we open up your word, as we open up this letter that was written to a specific people at a specific time, but Lord God, we know that it's been included in your word. And so this morning, may we gain from it more truth about who you are and our own identity found in that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So yes, we've been looking at Ephesians. And so this morning we look at Ephesians 4a, because there's a lot of... There's a lot in Ephesians 4. The last few chapters we've covered in one sermon, but they only had 20 or so verses. Uh, Ephesians 4 has 30 or so verses, and I wanted to really break things down. So we're going to do it in two parts. Is that all right? I hope so. I haven't written any notes for the second part, but you know, the Holy Spirit protects it. <laughs> the plan is to do Ephesians 4a. So if we look at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4, it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, what's interesting about how Paul starts Ephesians 4 is that he didn't know it was Ephesians 4 because the chapters were added later. So, last week we looked at Ephesians 3, and who remembers one of the big things that was in Ephesians 3? We talked about Jews and Gentiles, and how the word meaning for Gentile was essentially everybody other than a Jew, um, or another group of people. And so we talked about how Jesus had been the, essentially the Jewish Messiah that had been prophesied in the Jewish scriptures. Um, and that Paul basically comes along and goes, you know that Messiah that you thought was just for you, he's actually for everybody. And so he's talking, uh, saying that, you know, Jesus and salvation is for anyone who would believe, both Jews and Gentiles. And so we see at the start of chapter 4, this point is almost being hammered home again. He's like <laughs> saying that they need to um, bear with one another in love. And then he goes on, there's one body and one spirit, and one, one, one. So that we're all under the one covenant, amen, which is really good. Because um, I'm pretty sure, though there was some family members, but I'm pretty sure I don't have any Jewish heritage. Um, but that doesn't actually matter because I'm still adopted into the kingdom of God, amen? Amen. amen. Awesome. Another interesting thing that um, you see in the beginning here is Paul saw his imprisonment as being for the Lord. Which I think is really fascinating and I was having a conversation with a friend a few weeks ago and I said I find thinking about Paul the Apostle really interesting because he's this like hero of the faith and he gets um, almost put on a pedestal and we think about it, him as this like big amazing person um, but there's actually evidence to suggest that Paul was almost um, quite muckled over. Uh, and he's also referred to as, as a short man a lot, um, and all these things. He wasn't he wasn't anything to look at. He wasn't, he wasn't very impressive in his physique, um, and he actually upset a lot of people. And 
so I was talking with my friend that said it's really interesting because we want to run around and live these glorious lives and be hashtag blessed and all these things, but Paul was in prison. Um, so are we, are we willing to go to prison? What does that actually look like? But we see here that Paul saw his imprisonment as being from the Lord. He was like, not from the Lord, for the Lord. It's a key difference there. But, you know, he's like, I'm a prisoner to the Lord. Whatever I'm doing in my life, it is for the glory of God. Be that whether I'm on a mountain top, um, be that whether I'm traveling around and planting churches, which would have been so exhilarating. Like the life he lived previous to that would have been pretty amazing to go and do some of the things that he'd done. And now he's in prison. Um, and often it suggests that it's more like a home confinement, is that the word? Yeah, when you're in prison but you're actually at home. House arrest. House arrest, yes. Sorry, I've got scenes. Or not, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so we see Paul here and he's saying, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where I am or what I'm doing, I'm doing it for the Lord. What an amazing like posture of his heart to be able to say that. But he goes on, he's like, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And I really like this scripture. It's one that I've thought about a lot in my own life. You know, what does it look like to live a life worthy of the calling you have received? And that's not specific to pastors or anybody else. He's writing this to the whole church. He's saying that as believers, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, that, you know, it's an every believer ministry, that we're all saints. But he's like, live a life worthy of that calling. And he goes on, be humble, be gentle, all of these things. And that by itself almost seems like this great challenge and you can think, well, what does that look like? What is my calling? What, do, what, what does it mean to live a life worthy of my calling? How do I go from here to there? But Paul addresses this in his next sentence. Be completely humble and gentle and to keep in unity with the Spirit. So he's saying you don't need to struggle and strive and we have seen this in the first part of Ephesians that our identity comes from knowing who we are in Christ. It comes from not struggling and striving to do great things, but to being completely obedient to Jesus and his Holy Spirit. We see this in the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So he's not talking about coming under a law and struggling and striving to live a life that's worthy of your calling. He's saying the more that we submit and we are humble, the more that we understand that we are supposed to live in unity with the Holy Spirit, the more these things naturally flow out of us because we have a closeness with God. We see this all in the, in the foundations of these first three chapters. So Ephesians 4 doesn't exist in and of itself. If you read it in and of itself, you might think, I can never attain that. I can never do that. I can't actually, I'm only human. I cannot live a life that's worthy of the calling. But we need to understand it in the context of those first three chapters. And if you haven't been here for those messages, my homework for you this week is go and read the first three chapters of Ephesians. Because he had us home that point that we need to be living <coughs> in communion with the Holy Spirit. And we see again that Paul drives home that point that we are one body um, made in Christ, one Lord, one faith. We're all part of the body of Christ. And he goes on to talk more about this body. Now, you've probably all seen this before, but I just wanted to share it one more time because I think it's great. It says, people ask me, do you need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven? Bruh, you need the Holy Spirit to go to Target. Like, we literally need the Holy Spirit for every moment of our lives, you know. And so we can get into these kind of doctrinal debates about who, who's baptized with the Holy Spirit and what do we need the Holy Spirit for. We need the Holy Spirit for everything. And, you know, just have him for everything and that will be great. Like, it's, we overcomplicate things. So Paul goes on in Ephesians 4, 7 to 10. It says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned, as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. We see again, just at that first bit, and then we'll get into the second bit. But to each one, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So we talked about this last week, but sometimes we give, we're given a grace in our lives for different things or for different people. Um, and the really good example I gave is I believe that God gives a real grace 
often to parents because my children do things sometimes and if they weren't my children, I don't know. But, but I love them and they're my children and I have a grace for them even though they make the same mistake again and again and again, even though they do different things. <sighs> there it is. I knew I was sneezing at some point. <laughs> so we see this, that God gives us a grace for things and for people and for different times and seasons. One of my favourite songs um, of... 2020, um, was a song called Ain't No Grave, and it's very, I don't know, 20, it's almost country music sounding, it's out of Bethel, I don't know how it would go on a Sunday morning, but I really love these lyrics and I want to read them to you, it says, there was a battle, a war between death and life, and there on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified, and he went on down to hell, and he took back every key, he rose up as a lion, and he set all the captives free, you know, and I just... I love that. I'm like, yes, you know, we serve a God that actually has dealt with sin and death on our behalf. And so Paul's about to go into the gifts uh, that, that, that Christ has given to the body um, of believers. But first he just makes this point that when he ascended on high, he took many captures and gave gifts to his people. And then he also descended, and, and he spoke about this, I think, last week in communion, um, that when Christ was on the cross, yes, he went through tremendous physical suffering, and I, I don't ever want to diminish that at all, but also there was this spiritual turmoil, like he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and he goes on, he, he goes down to hell and he takes back all the keys, like there's, there's a lot that happens in those three days that we probably won't know everything about until we're in heaven, but, you know, we serve a God that did that on our behalf. And so I love the fact that Paul always takes this pause to explain that before he goes on to talk about the gifts. Because we can really easily get to a place where we're like, oh, isn't it great? God's so good and we're going to be blessed and he gives these gifts and he does these things. But Paul's like, hang on a second, just before we get there, let's actually take a pause and remember what Christ has done for us. Thank you, Lord. So he cannot resist to take a moment and talk about all Christ has done and his magnitude. So it's in order to fill the whole universe, like, in order to fill the whole universe, oh my goodness. I wasn't going to do this, I was actually going to finish with communion this morning, but I think maybe we should pause now before we look at these next few verses and take communion together, because... I think we should do exactly what Paul has done and just stop and take a minute to thank Jesus for his sacrifice. So Josh, do you want to maybe, and, and Michael, do you want to hand out the communion elements? Lord, just like Paul 
Paul stopped in his letter and, and describes your death and your resurrection in those three days. Lord God, we're stopping in the middle of our service, in the middle of our sermon, because we want to remember, Lord God, everything that you sacrificed for us. So we thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken. next part of Ephesians now. So Ephesians, there you go, <laughs> they all look the same, Ephesians 4 verse 11 to 13, it says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up with all reach, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, I could probably tell you a number of different books that I have read um, about just this scripture. <laughs> so, you know, for example, there's a book called The Contra Motto, which talks about the fivefold ministry um, and how it's been utilised by a church um, to really bring about growth and blessing within their church community. Um, there is a whole series of books, a whole course you can do called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, um, which talks about how we've actually become mature Christians. So just in these few verses, people have spent their whole lives, um, or big portions of their lives, studying this and going through it and working out what exactly it means, what these gifts actually mean. You know, this is something that has been talked about for generations. So I'm going to summarise some things in the next few minutes, but... Just to let you know, this is not the be-all or the end-all, this is to just, you know, whet your appetite to give us an idea of what Paul is talking about here. Do you, I don't know why I'm sneezing this morning. <laughs> so, just to go through first, so this is often referred to as the fivefold ministry. If you go into Google and you type the fivefold ministry, you might see a diagram which says it's the hand of God, uh, and then it has the different things listed on the fingers, or you can see other diagrams that are far more complex. But the idea is that these are the, the five major ministry giftings that people, um, it's often said that people are born with, um, or that people are almost predestined to, that God puts these people in to, and like it says, to equip the body. Um, but they're particular kind of almost leadership giftings that are given to the body. So we're going to have a look really briefly about what each one means. So the first one um, is apostles. So apostles are often pioneers and visionaries. We often hear the word apostle connected to the disciples and to Paul. But uh, what does it mean to be a modern day apostle? We see this in your know, people that um, have great vision, that are able to expand things, have ideas, are able to bring that kind of broader leadership. Um, so often you see apostles, they might end up being uh, the leader of a movement or the leader of um, bigger organisations. An apostle, I think, would probably um, get bored and need to do other things when in a smaller church. I have friends that I, I would have, I guess, have that kind of apostle type gifting, and they don't just run their church, they run this organisation, they do this, they do this, and so there's that greater viewpoint um, from the apostles. Prophets. So, prophets and prophecy is a really interesting one because I believe that every believer has the ability to prophesy, yeah? Um, every believer has that gifting to be able to speak out what the Holy Spirit is putting on them. There's also the gifting of a prophet. So we see this in people that speak in, in broader terms. Um, 
you know, there's a few different people that I follow online that I would consider prophets, and they speak out things that, you know, over the, their country or over their church or over their denomination or over different things that are happening, they have that prophetic gifting, and they often will work hand in hand with an apostle. So a prophet releases God's word and truth, and prophets often receive messages from God that they then share with others to prepare God's people. Prophets also have a role in interceding for people. This means they can, this means that a prophet can prophesy over others to edify or build up the church and its leaders. So we see, you know, prophecy should be edifying um, and should be a tool that is used to build up the church. We see evangelists. Um, evangelists gather people. <laughs> I like that. So you know, an evangelist is somebody that. Um, I have a friend. I have a friend who I believe is an evangelist. I don't know whether they would say that about themselves, but I very much believe they're an evangelist. Now I have travelled with said friend before. I've driven down to Melbourne, um, and on the way there, I learnt that we were not going to get home in the kind of nine or so hours that I would typically take to drive home from Melbourne, because when we stopped for lunch, we also for some reason ended up in the butcher's shop. I don't even know why. I think somebody else that was with us used to be a butcher. So they poke their head into the butcher's shop, they find out that butcher's wife serves them, find out that her mother-in-law's got cancer and the business isn't doing very well, and so then all of a sudden we're in the butcher shop praying for this person, and so our, our quick little lunch stop took over an hour. Um, because evangelists will gather people, they will find out people's stories, they will, you know, so they're, they're great fun to be around. Um, they just can't help but share their faith. Now, evangelism is another one where not, I don't believe that every single believer has that gift of an evangelist. Now, who has met an evangelist before? Um, yeah. And so you know, don't, like, you just, they're like, blah! And <laughs> great fun. Um, so while some people have that, that gifting of an evangelist, I think it is um, every believer's responsibility to evangelize. Yeah? Yeah. The role of a pastor as that kind of gifting, as a pastor is someone who shepherds the flock, so the local church. This means that they care for the spiritual needs of the people in their church. Pastors also have a role in teaching and preaching, um, and they often will, you know, so we, we're familiar with the role of a pastor, but I've often heard the role of a pastor, you know, is that real pastoral, is that real shepherding, that wanting to know and care for your pastoral needs. And it's an interesting one because we've attached it to ordination, so you know, you're ordained as a pastor. Um, but many um, movements are actually moving away from ordaining people as pastors or ordaining them as ministers. Because sometimes it's an apostle that's running that church, or sometimes it's a teacher that's running that church. Um, and they might have other people in their church that has that pastoral gifting. To, so it's, we've kind of, it's one word that gets used for different things. And the role of a teacher, um, so a teacher is someone responsible for instructing others in the things of God. So um, I've been under teacher giftings, and you see it in a church where you get like the really detailed, and I believe that Josh always steps into this a little bit sometimes, like Josh will get up and he'll be like, well actually in the Hebrew, and they start pulling things from everywhere. And I can preach to you and yell at you that God loves you till the cows come home and I love preaching and I try and make sure that I've researched things and I can give you a good amount of detail but I don't believe that I have a strong teacher gifting uh, but when you sit down to somebody that has a strong teacher gifting you get like almost overloaded well I feel like that's probably because it's my personality type other people love it um, and so that's that kind of teacher gifting <clears throat> so that's what those are for a very brief overview. And it's interesting because some people would say, and it is quite commonly said that you know, people have those giftings for their whole life, but also I think in different times God calls us into different things. But essentially there's this theory, which I would probably subscribe to, that when a church functions really well, it has all five of those offices or roles um, being fulfilled. You know, when you have somebody. So my heart when I'm praying for the church is like, God, would you send somebody with a, with a teaching gifting? Would you send somebody with an evangelism gifting so that we can move in those spheres? So it's interesting, and we can look at these things and go, okay, Lord, I mean, we, you could go and do an online quiz if you want and find out what giftings you have, apparently. Um, <laughs> or we can sit there, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm not a leader, um, I don't really know what my role is and all that. Like, that's 
really great, but I don't really feel like I have any giftings, or what does that really look like for me? So what is so crucial here is the next part. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. We see that. Um, so we, we read that, but then he says,
Linford in, myself included, and there's probably other areas of your spirituality of your life that um, you are fully grown in and you understand, but uh, I'm not getting up here and I'm not for a minute saying, you're all babies and we need to get our act together, but what I'm saying is that God's heart for us is that he's constantly maturing us as people so that we can be his body. He doesn't want us to be blown back and forth. You know, there's a verse in Timothy that says the time is coming when people will listen to anything that their itching ears want to hear. There's so much in the world at the moment that is grasping for our attention, but Christ wants us to be rooted together in love, to be his body, with him as the head, and to be constantly maturing in that. I just love that. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's just so beautiful. And that's my heart, my goal for us as a church, as a body believers in Broken Hill, but it's also my heart for the church, capital C, across the world, is that we would be built up as a body of believers, that there would be unity and love that is so different to what the world has that it draws people in, that they might come to know Christ. So if you're able, why don't you stand this morning and pray over us all?